Cześć, dzień dobry, Artur Wiśniewski, stockbroker.pl. Witam Cię serdecznie na pasywnej rewolucji i zapraszam na wywiad. Moim rozmówcą będzie Rick Ferry, inwestor ze Stanów Zjednoczonych Ameryki, znany m.in. w społeczności Bogleheads. Ojcem inwestowania pasywnego był John C. Bogle, znany również jako Jack Bogle. Jego pasywne podejście zyskało wielu zwolenników i naśladowców. Tak powstała społeczność Bogleheads, do której należy m.in. Rick Ferry. Zresztą Rick Ferry prowadzi również podcast dla społeczności Bogleheads, a pierwszym jego gościem był właśnie John C. Bogle. Rick w naszej rozmowie będzie przekonywał, że podejście pasywne jest najlepsze dla większości inwestorów. Będę go pytał, jakie aktywa warto mieć w w portfelu w ramach podejścia pasywnego, gdzie jest granica między inwestowaniem aktywnym i pasywnym i w jakim zakresie warto czy można dostosowywać portfel pasywny do swoich indywidualnych bądź lokalnych warunków. Mam nadzieję, że będzie to dla Was przydatne. Serdecznie Was zapraszam. Do oglądania. Hello, Rick. Thank you very much uh, for accepting invitation to our conference. Welcome. Uh, I'm really honored that you are one of our guests. Um, when I first uh, announced that uh, you are going to be our special guest in our conference, uh, the audience was uh, really enthusiastic about that. But there are, of course, uh, many people who don't know you in Poland because you are in the US. So please, uh, Tell us a few words uh, about yourself. What do you do? What is your experience? I read on your webpage that you used to be a stockbroker and you left your institution because you didn't like the sales policy they had, uh, the, the sales culture, which really sounds very similar to my history. But okay, could you please tell us a few words about yourself? What do you do? What is your experience? Well, thank you for inviting me today. I appreciate the opportunity to spread the word about low cost investing globally. Uh, It's a mission of mine and a mission of uh, the late Jack Bogle to uh, spread the message of uh, self-management, low cost index investing um, around the world because it's so important. They, my background is uh, in the 1970s, I was in college getting a degree in uh, business. And then in the 1980s, I went into the military and served my country for eight years. I was a fighter pilot in the Marine Corps. And in the late 1980s, I left uh, active duty military and I entered the investment industry. And uh, here, back in the 1980s, uh, really the only place you could go if you wanted to enter the investment industry was into the brokerage industry and become a stockbroker. So that's what I did. And in 1988, I became a a stockbroker. 1989, I started my business after taking all the exams that I had to take. I thought that being a stockbroker, you did a lot of analysis and you chose what you believed were the good investments that were going to outperform the markets uh, and that you had the support of your company and the research staff to do that so that you would do well for your clients you would do well for the firm and you would do well for yourself. And in theory, that is the out, that's the image. But as I got into the industry more and more, I realized that it was not about doing well for the clients. It was about 
distributing products and collecting fees and commissions. And we, the stockbrokers, were not judged on how well the clients performed. We were judged based on how much money, how much commission and fees we generated for the company. No one ever asked me in the eight years or the 10 years that I was in the brokerage industry as a stockbroker, no, no one, no one from management ever asked me, how are your clients performing? How well are the accounts performing? They honestly didn't care. What they cared about was how much money are we generating from the clients? And this became more and more clear to me, and it was frustrating. Uh, I had a personal self-study program. I got a chartered financial analyst, a CFA designation. So I went through that self-study program. It took three years. I went and achieved my master's of science in finance, a uh, advanced college degree a graduate degree, and I was trying to understand how it all works. How can I do the best for my clients? I didn't really care about how much money my company was making. If they were making it because my clients were doing well, that's fine, but that's not what was happening. So I became very frustrated after several years, and I was going to leave the industry in the um, mid 1990s. But then I listened to a speech by a fellow by the name of John Bogle. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but uh, John Bogle started a company called Vanguard and they created the first index funds because he had realized that it's really difficult to outperform the markets. And if all you did was get the return of the markets in a low cost product, like an index fund that just tracks the markets, you as an investor would be further ahead. And this made complete sense to me. I, it was clearly what I was seeing. My data was saying the same thing. I brought this to the attention of my managers in the brokerage industry who absolutely did not want to hear it, did not want to see it, told me not to talk about it, don't tell anybody else about it. And I realized that I needed to leave the brokerage industry if I wanted to do what was in my client's best interest. So I did. It took me a few years to get my own company up and running. But in 1989, I started a money management company where for a very low fee, I charge my clients a very low fee and I put their money into very low cost market tracking index funds. And they did very well. Now, since then, um, I'm in the later part of my career now. I sold the, that company a few years ago after 17 years. And now I just consult with individuals one on one and they pay me an hourly fee. So I'm not managing money anymore. Uh, I'm just helping people one on one and they pay me an hourly fee for my advice. Plus, I'm I'm doing a lot of charity work and I'm I'm doing a podcast and I do a lot of writing to try to help people and podcasts like this to try to help people uh, understand this whole side of investing and how it can help you. So that's my story. Thank you, Rick. Uh you mentioned Jack Bogle that he affected your investment philosophy. Could you, according to uh, to him, uh, could you tell us also about Bogleheads because you are connected with this society? Can I can you also tell us about uh, Bogleheads? A few words. Sure. So there was a lot of people out there who had the same feeling that I had, I wasn't alone. And when I listened to Jack Bogle speak in 1996, and he changed my views, and then I read his book uh, that he wrote called Bogle on Mutual Funds, I realized am that I, there was a lot of people out there. Like am I right me. that he was your uh, first uh, discussion partner in your podcast? Yes, he was. The very first podcast I did, I was very fortunate 
to have Jack Bogle be my very first guest. The podcast is called Bogle uh, Heads on Investing, Bogle Heads on Investing. And I just published a new one today. I've been doing it for three years. Uh, I was very fortunate to get Jack Bogle as the very first podcast guest because he unfortunately passed away a couple of months after that. So it's one of the last things that he did was uh, was a guest on my podcast. And he we talked about a lot of things about his life and about the evolution of indexing. And uh, it's, it's a really uh, touching uh, podcast. So if you'd like to listen to it, it's a Bogle Heads on Investing podcast number one with Jack Bogle. Uh, so it is, um, uh, but, but there were, I realized once in, in the late 90s, about 25 years ago, that I wasn't alone in the way that I was thinking. In fact, by 1999, there was a small group of people who started posting online, individuals. This is the, just, just individual investors. At first, they started posting on the Morningstar website because there was a chat room there. So they started something called the Vanguard Diehards. That eventually moved off of the Morningstar website into its own website at bogleheads.org where it's just a grassroots, we call it, just a individuals who get on there and, and help other individuals. And this has grown. Uh, if you, it, It's grown to a very large organization, literally millions of people call themselves Bogleheads, hundreds of thousands of people for free have joined uh, Bogleheads.org to be able to ask questions. It's all free. That There's no cost to anyone. And you get very good direct answers from people who have no conflicts of interest, no biases. And there's very knowledgeable people on there, many um, academics, uh, many uh, investment people. I mean, you get really top level advice for free. And uh, we now have chapters all over the world and uh, we do podcasts, we have Facebook page, we have Twitter accounts, we have, we're growing. Uh, it's all done under what's called the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, which is a nonprofit organization. And at this moment, I happen to be the president of the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy. So there's a lot going on. And I appreciate you asking about the Bogle heads. Uh, I admit that you were really lucky to uh, to be able to have uh, a discussion with with Jack Bogle, um, and uh, he was the father of passive investing. Could you tell us what is actually passive investing, and how to build a passive portfolio? The first sure, question well, is is what kind of assets should should appear in such portfolio, and how to manage it. Well, that, there's a lot of questions there. So let's talk about the first one, which is what is passive investing? So there are two thoughts, two philosophies of investing, two. One of them is what we call active investing. And here is where we are trying to get the highest returns that we can get. We are trying to beat the stock market. We're trying to outperform the stock market or outperform the bond market. We're trying to win. We're trying to beat the other investors out there. And uh, so you go out and you do a lot of research and you try to pick the investments that you believe are going to be the best and they're going to outperform. Well, that's very, very difficult to do. Even the professionals have very few professionals are able to do it. Some can, some have. We just don't know which ones they'll be in the future. So it's difficult to pick today who is going to outperform. So the alternative to doing that, where you'll do very well, you'll do what the market does, the stock market or the bond market, you'll perform exactly what the stock market does. This is called passive investing. And what research has found is that people who just get the returns of the markets, 
instead of trying to beat the markets, perform better than a vast majority of the people who are trying to beat the market. So the people who are trying to beat the markets, very few actually do it. Most underperform, most because of fees, because of turnover. Most of the people who are trying to outperform the market actually end up underperforming the market. So all of you, if all you did was get the return of the market, then it puts you above those other people. So you, you actually outperform almost everybody else by being a passive investor. It's odd, but this is true. And so if you're trying to do the best for yourself, because we don't have any good information about what companies are going to outperform in the future and what are not, a lot of it has to do with just luck. That if you want to do well for yourself and you want to be in the top 90, the top 10% of investors, so you're going to beat 90% of the other investors who are trying to beat the market. You just be the market. You just don't try to beat the market. You just be the market. You buy an <laughs> index fund that gives you the return of the markets, the stock market and the bond market. And I don't know in your country what you have available, but in the United States, there's a lot of different index funds that are available that allow you to do that. And they're put out by Vanguard and State Street and uh, iShares and Schwab and Fidelity. I mean, there, there's a lot of index fund providers and, and the costs are extremely low. So you can put together a portfolio of stocks and bonds using index funds and your cost will be very, very low. And I don't know how it is in your country, but that's the way it is here. But it is spreading. It is spreading uh, globally. I know Vanguard is in Europe and, and they have a robust lineup. So, you know, if you just default to doing index investing, you're going to be in the top of all investors. Ironic as it seems, the less you do, the better you perform. And uh, it, it, it makes sense to me. I'm not trying to sell anything. So <laughs> it makes sense to me. So how to build such portfolio, a passive portfolio? Well, that depends on you. In other words, you as an individual have your own goals. Um, the philosophy of index investing is universal throughout the world. If you can do it, then that, that's how you should, you, you should build your portfolio using low cost passive funds. But how you should build your portfolio how much in stocks, how much in bonds, how much in um, your uh, country's index, how much in the world index. This all depends on your needs, your strategy. So we have the philosophy of indexing, which I talked about. Now we're talking about strategy. And by strategy, I mean, what should you do? How should your portfolio be set up? How much should be in stocks? How much should be in bonds? How much should be in cash? And that is very personal. Uh, this, you know, I, I, I don't have a answer for what you should do because I don't know anything about you. I don't know how much you've saved. I don't know how much you earn. I don't know how much you're making. I don't know how much your goals are. I don't know about your family. I don't know about your taxes. I don't know how much ability you have to withstand the up and down movement of the markets. We would have to have a conversation, which is what I do now with my clients, a conversation about all of that. And then after we have that long conversation about who you are and what you're trying to do and what you want this money to do for you. Then we can start talking about, well, let's put a portfolio together of these passive products that has the highest probability or the, that fits what it is you're trying to do. And, and so that's the answer that the philosophy is global. The philosophy is universal strategy, your personal strategy is really personal. And, and, and I can't answer it. 
I can tell you how to do it. I can tell you the process to do it. But in, in this conversation today, I can't say do this because everybody's different. Everyone's different. You mentioned stocks and bonds, also cash. Uh, is there any space in, in passive portfolio for other assets like gold, uh, commodities, uh, uh, and other uh, assets, uh, types of uh, types of assets? Well, I I don't use them. My belief is I invest in things that have cash flow, things that are going to produce cash. So bonds produce interest. It's cash coming in. And so the day I invest in a bond fund, I start getting cash back. Stocks are the same way. Stocks are a going concern. You invest in a stock index fund. The stocks earn money. The companies earn money. They distribute that money or in the form of a dividend or they buy back shares or they expand their company. So it's a going concern. It's generating cash. Personally, I like that. that I like companies that generate cash. Over time, I'll get my money back just from this cash flow. Commodities are not that way. There's no cash. Uh, cyber currencies, currencies, Bitcoin, so forth. There's no cash generated. It's 100% price speculation. You're, if you buy here, you're hoping somebody else buys there so that you make a profit. There's no cash flow. A, a bar of gold doesn't become two bars of gold over 10 years. It doesn't multiply into little bars of gold. It's just a bar of gold that sits there. So the only way that you're going to make money on that commodity is if someone else is willing to give you more money for it later on down the road. Okay, well, that might be fine for some investors. For me, I like cash flow. I like money coming in. And so I don't want to rely on me buying something at this price and then being able to sell it at that price. I, I don't want to rely on that speculation. So I believe bonds, stocks, cash, these things that produce cash, to me, that makes the most sense for long-term investors. Should the passive portfolio be adjusted locally? Uh, for example, what about um, currency hedging? For example, I'm a Polish investor, and if I want to have a global portfolio, mm -hmm. so for example, in the bond part, in the fixed income part, uh, the currency really changes the volatility. It increases the volatility, so it behaves almost like stocks. So, uh, what do you think about adjusting lock, adjusting, uh, adjusting passive hedging. portfolio to to, lo to local uh, to local conditions? For example, hedging. Hedging, sure. So yes, you would want to hedge your currency because you're in a you know, different country. Um, you would want to hedge against a downturn in your own currency to a point, not 100%, because you do have to pay your bills in local currency. So your expenses when you retire and you begin to use this money are going to be in local currency. So you're not going to hedge 100%, but you're going to hedge a lot of your portfolio to hedge out your local currency. You get a diversified portfolio current. But you don't need to do that because if you invest in a bond fund, a bond index fund, you can invest in one that's already hedged. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know about your country, but it, it, in a lot of countries, you can invest in a stock portfolio that's already had in the United States. If I invest in a international stock index fund, it's not in US dollars. It's in all other currencies. So it's not hedged to the US dollar. So I get exposure to all these other currencies through the stocks. I'm still getting my cash flow, but I'm, I'm getting currency exposure because the stocks are list are in local currency at the uh, different countries. The same thing with various bond funds that you can buy. So 
Yeah, depending on the country you live in, you would want to hedge either some of the, here in the United States, I hedge maybe 20% of the portfolio by being in international stocks uh, on, the, on the stock side. Um, but in your country, it might be more than that. It might be 50% or so. I think that that's a local thing that you as a financial advisor would have to work out. And what about adjusting the portfolio to market conditions for example we look at interest rates uh, and we think okay now it's time for this type of bonds okay or maybe it's now time for other type type of bonds what about adjusting the portfolio to market conditions is it a good idea that's active management so you are making a bet that now is the time. That's very difficult to do. What if you didn't make that bet? What if you just owned everything? You just own everything and, and you're already diversified. So you don't have to make that bet. But to move from this segment to this segment and from this to that based on what you think you know, it's time, that's, you could be wrong. And, and that could cost you money. Instead of doing that, you passively own everything. And then you don't have to make those bets. And you find, getting back to my original active versus passive, you find that 90% of the time, the people who don't make those bets that just own everything do better. They do better. And so you don't have to, if, if you, you just need to decide how much in bonds, fixed income and cash, how much in stock, keep it at that allocation. If the stock market goes way up, you'll sell some stock, you buy some more bonds. If the stock market goes down, you sell some bonds, you buy some more stocks, you just maintain the same allocation. You actually do better doing this. It, it's mathematically shown, proven academically that this works. I'm as simple as it sounds. It can't be that easy, but it is. It is that easy. That's, that's all you have to do, but you have to do it. And this gets us to the third leg of how to be a good investor. We talked about the philosophy. We talked about the strategy, which is your individual portfolio. The third leg of the stool is the discipline. You have to actually implement your strategy and believe in it and maintain it. So you do the rebalancing. You, you don't decide in a year you're going to be moving your portfolio around. You have to maintain the discipline. Those are the three things that make you a successful investor. Having the philosophy, the passive philosophy, creating a strategy for your needs, your asset allocation between stocks and bonds, and then having the discipline to implement it and keep it. And if you do those three things, you're going to outperform 90% of everybody else. When is the best moment to start a passive portfolio? Uh, I'm sure like, you know, now is a good time. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, I think you. I think you know what is the most frequent objection against uh, going with the passive portfolio. Okay, now the markets are too expensive. We can hear it. We've been hearing it for ten years. So, uh, is it a good moment to start the passive portfolio? <laughs> Well, are you going to invest anyway? What if you didn't do a passive portfolio? What would you do? What would you do if you didn't do a passive portfolio? You'd still be investing. You'd just be investing in this and that and that and this and this and that. You'd be doing active management, which again, you will underperform. So yeah, if, if you're thinking long-term, not thinking tomorrow or next week, this is not a strategy for gambling. This is not a strategy for speculating. This is a strategy for saving money that you're going to need in retirement down the road. That, that's what this is. 
Okay, it is beyond, way beyond what's going to happen next week. Are the markets expensive? Here in the United States, everything is expensive. Real estate is expensive. Bonds are expensive because interest rates are low. Stocks are expensive. But the most expensive thing is leaving your money in cash because the inflation rate here in the United States is about 4% right now. And cash is yielding about zero. So you're guaranteed to lose 4% of your money <laughs> to inflation. So it, there's no easy solution. You have to get beyond what's just in front of you. You look at the long term and say, okay, I, I'm not going to need this money for 10 years, 15, 20 years. I can sustain all of the noise that's going on out there and, and downturns. And uh, you have to invest. I mean, unfortunately, we must invest. If we don't, we are going to lose because of inflation. You will lose. Your purchasing power will go down if you don't invest your money to at least try to get a rate of return where you can at least maintain the value of what you have. So you have to invest. The question is, how? Passively or actively? You really don't have, unless you get very lucky, you don't have much of a chance to do it active. You don't have it. You're not going to do as well as if you do it passively. And the three strat, the three, three things that I talked about. I mean, pension funds don't just decide one day we're going to get out of the market. Now we're going to get back in. Now we're going to get out. They don't. They're investing long term down the road for their beneficiaries of the pension fund. And this is how an individual investor needs to invest as well. Okay. And uh, what about small caps, thematics, uh, ESG? We have a few st really strong trends in ETF market. Is it all... Is it all this the waste of time? <laughs> it's a it, small cap is already part of the total stock market index fund. So if you go to buy an index fund, let's say you're going to buy a world equity fund that owns all of the stocks in the entire world. And we have one of those in the United States. And you can buy it very low cost. You can own all the stocks in the world, like 10,000 stocks that are that have enough trading volume. It already has small cap in it. It already has micro cap and mid cap. It's already there. It, it, it's part of the portfolio. You don't have to go out and buy it separately. Now, ESG, which is uh, uh a type of investing where you have social, personal social beliefs about energy or uh, military weapons or, uh, and you don't want to invest in those companies that do that. There are ESG index funds that would exclude that. I don't think the performance is going to be as well, but if you feel very strongly about not owning tobacco companies or nuclear power companies or companies that are fossil fuel companies, um, then, then you can invest in an index fund that excludes those companies. And it's still a very, at least in the United States, it's still very, very low cost, but it just excludes those companies. It's the same thing. I don't know if the performance is going to be as high. The performance is going to be a little bit different. The fees are a little bit higher. But if this is what you want personally, then you can do that with, uh, with index funds. Okay, so the last question. Do you see any space for active investing uh, in individuals' portfolio? There is there is some research uh, which shows which proves that uh, 
active investing uh, sometimes works. For example, the momentum phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So is there any space for active investing or, or no? What you described called momentum is a factor. It's a factor. It's, it's a way of investing in companies that just did well and therefore the momentum means they might continue to do well over the next year. Okay. If you believe that, and, you know, it, is it proven? Well, it's proven that it happened in the past. That's been proven that it happened in the past. Whether it happens in the future, we don't know that. <laughs> it's a probability that it might, but we can't say that it will. We don't know. Value investing the same way. Value investing has shown in the past that it has outperformed growth investing. I mean, growth stocks like technology stocks. Now, that's what happened in the past. Now, will it happen in the future? I don't know. But academically, in the past, theoretically, remember that actually wasn't funds that did this going back 50 years, but it did outperform. So if you decide that you want to have more of your portfolio in value stocks, or momentum stocks, or what they call a multi-factor fund, which is value and momentum together. And then you could take, say, 25% of your stock portfolio that would ordinarily be in passive index funds that are just getting the return of the market, so 25%, and put it into a multi-factor fund that may, may outperform in the future, it will always guaranteed be more expensive. It will cost you more money, guaranteed. That's a guarantee. It more money to do that. It might work. You might outperform with that 25% or you might not. But the one thing for certain that I know is if you don't hold on to that 25% in the same strategy for about 25 years, so you got 75% of the total market, 25% in this multi-factor, you need to hold on to that strategy for about 25 years, exactly the same, and don't change it, to perhaps potentially get the benefit of the small value. You can't do it as a trade. You can't put money in small value momentum because you heard that, oh, it, it could outperform. And, and a year later, when it doesn't, you know, you, you leave because that just hurts you. That, that lowers your return. That lowers your return. You, if you're going to do that, first of all, you must understand exactly what you're doing. We'll understand thoroughly why you're doing that, why you're going to deviate from the market return to go to this factor, small cap value momentum strategy with a small portion of the portfolio. You must thoroughly understand it so that you have the discipline to hold on to that for years and years and years. You must believe in it so much that you have the discipline to hold on to it for years and years and years, because if you do not, then you won't, you'll underperform. You're better off not doing it at all. So yes, it, it does have a place, but you have to have very strong discipline to maintain it in the years when it doesn't do well. And it may not do well for a decade. I mean, it hasn't done well for about a decade. Uh, now more than that maybe 15 years so maybe it will do well over the next 15 years i don't know but if you want to take a bet i'd say limit it to about 25 percent, and then you have to keep it for a long long time okay i think active investing is the answer to those who are afraid of losing their money uh, so uh as 
from what but what you say that active investing is not a good idea not a good answer to those fear so am i right that you think that the passive investing um is telling is telling that you should simply control your risk pro your risk profile in your portfolio so if you are afraid just have less stocks and more bonds that's Would exactly you agree correct. with that or or any that, or, or or are there any other solutions, possible solutions? No, you, you, you've hit the nail. If you are afraid, then just own less stock. Own only the amount of stock that will allow you to stay invested in that portfolio with discipline for many, many years. Maybe that's only 30% stock. Maybe it's 40% stock. This gets into the strategy that we talked about earlier, the philosophy is to do passive investing in bonds and stocks and cash passively. The strategy is how much stock should you have for your situation, including what you just talked about. You know, what if you're afraid? If you're afraid, own, then you should own less stock because if you own less stock and the market goes down, you're less apt to sell. And again, you have to maintain the discipline of keeping the allocation. So if you own 40% stock and you don't sell, it's better than if you owned 60% stock and the market went down and you sold. That's worse. You own more stock, but you weren't able to maintain your portfolio when the market went down because you became afraid. So you were over-invested in stock. You went above your ability to handle the volatility. You have to be at a level where you'll be able to maintain this portfolio no matter what. And if the market does go down, you'll be selling some bonds and buying some more stock to bring you back up. You'll be doing the right thing. The market goes down, you're buying more to bring it back up to say 40%. Whereas if you were at 60% of the market went down, then you sold and you're selling at cheap, lower prices. I mean, it, it, you're, you're, you're better off having less stock and maintaining your asset allocation than having more stock and capitulating or selling when the market goes down. So you're correct on that. And to the last thought, what about dividing my capital into a few parts and investing one by one I invest the first part, I wait, and then I invest the second part. So the, the diversifying in the, in the in the time, what do you think about this idea? Now you're talking about something that we call dollar cost averaging. So as you have money, you put some money in and you wait a while and you put some more money in and you wait a while and you put some more money in. It's a dollar cost averaging. It makes people feel better. Um, and if that's what it takes for you to be disciplined, fine. That's fine. If this is what it takes for you to run your strategy and to be disciplined about it, that's fine. Now, I will say that life is a dollar cost average. Life is a dollar cost average. You are working. You are earning money. You are saving money. You're investing money. The next year, you work, you save, you invest. The next year, you work, you save, you invest. So you're doing it anyway. It, it, it happens anyway with life. When we're young, we have no money. Uh, and we accumulate money over time through our work. And then we take the excess money and we invest it. So you do it anyway. It happens anyway. Uh, but if you had a large amount of money that you got in cash, that you received in cash, maybe from an uncle or inheritance, and you want to invest it a little bit over time, that's fine. You have to come up with a strategy, and then you have to maintain the discipline to do it. So again, the philosophy of passive investing the strategy based on your needs, and then the discipline to implement it and maintain it. Those are the three things 
that make you a 90 percentile investor. Those are the three things that get up to you so that you are one of the best investors of anybody you know. But you're also very boring. You're very boring. You have no stories to tell. You People around you are talking about Bitcoin and they're talking about this stock and they're talking about that. Stock. You don't have that. You, all you know, I can tell you, you actually have the most money. They have the stories, but you have the most money <laughs> because you're doing it this other way. Okay, so let's try to make the shortest summary possible. Don't time the market. Buy global bonds and stocks. Do the re rebalancing and don't try to choose the right moments. But if you're afraid, just don't have too much stocks and start now. That's it. And just keep doing it. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. That's it. Rick, thank you very much. Uh, I was really honored that uh, I could talk to you. Thank you very much. And I hope we'll have another occasion to talk. See you next time. Well, thank you and good luck over there. And, and, and I wish you all uh, spread the word. Spread the word, by the way. It's very important. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.